going. Um, so I'm actually just gonna like move it, and uh, you can just introduce yourself and. Yeah. Hey y'all, my name's Khalil McCullen. Uh, I work with Drinking Gourd. Is just I organize with Drinking Gourd. Is as far as the work that I do, it's kind of all across the board. Uh, I'm originally from Augusta, Georgia, but I I got involved with Drinking Gourd because I was really hyped to uh to see the seed of uh abolition growing in Phoenix and that we're in at abolitionist org. So yeah, that's my first name. Yeah. <clears throat> Peace, coffee here. I organize with Drinking Gourd Farms as well. I come from a backyard, a background of education with youth and the healing arts as well. So being originally from San Diego, California, my grandmother always had a garden. We always grew a lot of things and went straight from farm to table, um, backyard to table. And uh, when I heard about Drinking Gourd Farms and they found out about what I was doing, it was just pure alignment. And so here we are. Um, and then I'm gonna skip me and Ibadi. Introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Ibadi Mahmoud. I come from East Africa, a um, small country called Somalia. Um, my background, farmers, is um, when I was young, very young. Um, I was grow up on um, industry farmers as as a refugee. Um, in in my own country, um, and I come this country for 1993 um, to do Arizona, and I've been in Arizona, and I will. I guess I it was me and Kim with thinking about it. What should we do on farm and it's like, uh, we can do here? Yeah. I go, that's kind of like a miracle, you know, to have a farm in here. Uh, what are we going to land? I say, we start in a backyard. I say, okay, what can I start mine? And it actually, um, to see that for me is is meaning on um, in my life is like, I'm home. I mean, I'm I'm here now, but I feel like I'm missing my home. And the part of this is, is like bringing me home and the life I grow up. And it's, to me, it's really my to have that opportunity. Um, and uh, I'm Ken Chapman, um, and I'm one of the organizers. Um, and uh, Nick, from the from the very beginning, uh, when we started to talk about and dream about uh, this idea of what it meant uh, for Black families to have access to and grow our own food, um, Ibaru um, was was actually the first person that we we had a conversation with, and she was uh, she was the one who um, uh, like recognized um, the the potential. Um, and so from there, we've just continued to grow. I want to just like really quickly uh, have other folks in the room just uh, just say your name um, and, and, and where you're from. Um, I'm, I'm come from Somalia. Go ahead. One more time. I come from Somalia, and I also live long time for California, about twenty three years and I moved in Arizona and I just miss California. My backyard is so dry, sunny, hot. And I say, what what are you gonna do? And and I try myself. I never try for grow <coughs> garden. I grow like farmer for animal or big city after when I grow up. And I just create myself and my backyard is a summer, nothing sand, nothing blaze. And I buy a, like a buck of this and I try to grow something and, and I get him well. And I just find an Ibado and cane and I'm so happy and all my backyard is so green, grow and just every morning I visited it and I see the flowers, I see the bees, I see the 
who's coming uh, back and he's so very happy and he still want to do other people and encourage them and just continue all my life. Hello everybody, my name is Nick Vaden. I'm originally from here. I think I'm the one Phoenix native actually, which yeah. is there's not many of us. Um, but for me, I just want to help black youth and black families um, eat healthy and get reconnected with the land um, and have our own food sources. So it's really important to me. Here's Gigi. Hello, my name is uh, Gabriel Salam. You call me Gigi. I'm from Ethiopia. My family about our life and as a farmer, but uh, I'm not grow with them. I must have them, but I came to uh, United States 27 years ago. So my bag, yeah, she told you, I'm a, she's a, this is my wife, so we do a backyard to feed the bar for us and for black people, so. Uh, and then, Kevin, you wanna? <laughs> Hello, my name is um, Kevin, and I just, um... <laughs> all right, I'll grab it. <laughs> no, it's okay. I thought you were gonna hold it. <laughs> so, I'll be really short. My name is Kevin. I recently uh, kinda, I've always wanted to learn how to grow, and recently just started doing it before, before learning about drinking gourd, and then just hearing about the vision, I was just like, oh, I gotta try and try and get in there and um, help out. And so that's why I'm here, just doing whatever, <laughs> whatever they need. And so, yeah, that's it. Anything else I should say? I'm from Panama. Um, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, that's good. That's it. All right. Um, so. Um, <laughs> you want to say hi? <laughs> that's Rob. <Robert. laughs> and that's Raji. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so uh, so this is this, this is a family affair um, in so many ways, um, and uh, this is actually the first time that we're actually able to all be in the, the same room together. And so we're we're taking this opportunity with y'all to uh, have some really good food um and uh enjoy each other um and uh and so we want to start sharing uh you know just like what we're what we're about um and uh so i'm gonna go ahead and, and share a screen um and then we can uh get into a little quick presentation and then really uh you know just want to have like conversation with y'all um All right, so Drinking Gourd Farms, we are basically a network of black gardeners, black farmers, homesteaders, and we've created a network to work together to generate our own food sources. So, in our movement that we are building, uh oh. Um, so Drinking Gourd Farms, uh, we're building a movement of black farmers, gardeners, and homesteaders, and we are focused on the physical, mental, and spiritual health of black folks through a movement of building agricultural, uh, health and wellness, as well as environmental stewardship. And so when we come back to the basics of tending to the land, we recognize that through our evolution of um, the Atlantic slave trade and then beyond that, that tending to the land has always been something that we've done through slavery, done through um, trying to facilitate food for ourselves. And so we're doing the same thing. And this here are, these here are a few photos that go through some of the gardens and the farms that we have created using what we have, such as our backyards, front yards, balconies, <laughs> Armenian cucumbers here. 
chickens. Our beautiful chickens. Luna, she's not right now, Luna. And so what we're doing right now, our chronic response to everything that's happening is to build and generate our own food sources. And this is what it looks like. And these here are some photos from our acute response that we've been working on for about 24 weeks now since COVID has hit the communities pretty hard. And so in our acute response, what we are doing is we are sourcing our food and we are feeding families and making sure that they have everything that they need. We are sourcing them from black farmers if we cannot do that ourselves. And uh, this here cow is actually from a homestead location up uh, in Queen Creek. Some beets. Um, so one of the, one of the important things to to recognize about uh, about Drinking Gore Farms is that. Uh, we are trying to uh, recognize um, and and really embody the fact that there is no there is no one singular way to be black or to or understand blackness. Um, that we have folks um, from across the the uh, diaspora, um, and whether that's uh, folks who are who are from the continent. Um, as immigrants and refugees, people who are uh, descendants of enslaved folks, um, or folks who are, are uh, Afro-Latino or otherwise mixed, like myself. Um, and uh, we, we want to, uh, like, first and foremost, uh, engage our work through that understanding of the complex identity of, of, of Blackness. Um, and look to start to build bridges. Um, and so like, you know, you, you can tell kind of by like our introductions, um, you know, we're all coming from different places. Uh, we all have different experiences. Uh, some, some folks have been growing food, some other, uh, others have never grown anything. Um, and all of what roots us here is this uh, abolition framework um, for, uh, for our work. Um, that allows us to uh, not just imagine a, a, a world, uh, but to actually tactile and like uh, and, and tangibly build it. So, want to let uh, Khalil talk a little bit about kind of like our political um, like framework, um, and then we can kind of get into so some other things from there. Yeah. Boom. You good? Back one more, is that it? That's what I said. Okay, cool. So yeah, sir. So yeah. So uh, like Kim was talking about, uh, our work is like grounded in abolition. And so when we're talking about abolition, right? We're talking about getting rid of these systems that are currently oppressing us. And we're and we're talking about our. This is program is about addressing the needs of black people specifically and if, like this graphic is just showing some of the systems right that we know are kind of interconnected in this oppression of black folks and all of us really but we're but we know that these things mostly impact black folks because of how this country's been structured from its beginning right and that's whether we're talking about the criminal justice system uh, uh, education, healthcare, the whole economic system but then food specifically being this base right that everything kind of uh, revolves around whether we have the food that we need to uh, lead healthy and like uh, fulfilled lives, right? So that's how we uh, frame food in this in in this larger project of abolition, right? So the food, the, the industrialized food system, is something that we see needs to be abolished, and we need to replace it with. Uh, Self-determined food sources, right? Food sources that we're growing for ourselves. That's from the um, ancestry that we all come from, right? So then, to to uh, break that down, we're talking about what is the industrialized food system, right? So first, it starts with the land. Um, if we're talking about growing food, right, you have to have land to grow it on, and this country's land has. Uh, been stolen from its inception, right, and uh, the genocide of indigenous people, and then the theft of African peoples and 
uh, to provide the labor to make that land viable. That's what the basis of this whole food system is here, right? And, and we think it's really important to uh, put that in the center so we understand uh, why we're working to abolish it because what it's built on in its base is uh, there is no room for justice, right? So, okay, if we're going, going, then going from that, uh, the land and the labor, then we get to uh, food apartheid. And food apartheid is like, uh, I, I think, and we'll, we're talking to the uh, sustainability school. So y'all probably heard of this term, but for anyone that hasn't, it's kind of like a advancement of the idea of food deserts, right? Where food deserts sound like there's something that naturally occurs and they're not a design thing. And um, the lens of food apartheid is, is really about highlighting the fact that the reason that uh, Black communities uh, don't have healthy food or access to healthy food sources is not because it just happens to be like that. It's because our system is set up so that there's not this access and that the actual healthy food sources are kept in one part of the community where folks, uh, less people have more access. Um, and then, okay, and then uh, part of that effects of food apartheid really is just the unhealthy food that ends up plaguing our communities, right? And uh, unhealthy, so there's there's one thing to not have any food, and then there's the thing, if you have food that's not really food, right, and it's just dye and chemicals, and you can't uh, have all the thought processes and lead the fulfilled life that we all deserve if you don't have healthy food. So then boom, Okay, boom, so then we get to, we were kind of zoomed in, right? So then if we zoom out, we're just talking about like, how does that unhealthy food get into communities? And it starts a lot of a time with uh, corporate farming, right? And about, uh, opposed to us as individuals uh, in, in like uh, small communities being able to collectively produce the foods that we need, uh, the majority of the foods that comes into most of our communities, but definitely into predominantly black communities, is this food that's produced by corporate farming and it's all profit based and there's no uh, focus on the people and the health of the people, right? So that we see that as a whole institution that has to be abolished. And then from there you get uh, GMO crops, right? And uh, GMO crops being a product of the corporate farming that in its whole global span. And then, um, and so, so one, we know that right GM, gmo crops are um they they don't have the health value that uh natural and organic crops do but then also it ends up having a whole uh social political and like economic effect on the communities where gmo crops get planted because then uh those that that land turns into land that's only growing mono crops right and people that have been growing variety of crops for however long and throughout throughout their lineage and they're able to produce for their families and have the food the culturally appropriate food that they want that gets taken out of the whole equation when gmo crops are being pushed on people through corporate farming um and i think in so seed saving and things like that become really important i think that's something we might get to later um and then okay more more effects of uh and just to zoom out more and to talk about how why the system has to be abolished right and because it, it doesn't just affect these communities that we're talking about, it affects the whole planet. So because of these corporate farming techniques, because of the GMO cross, right, there's this uh, constant uh, violence of the water drought on certain communities and then the pollution of all our water sources. And all of this leads to this larger climate change uh, scenarios, right, where we know that yeah, like we, we're, we're talking about uh, black liberation and about self-determination and we can't really have that if we don't have a planet that can support all of us. So um, yeah, that's like from the, from the ground to the zoomed out to see the globe, right? Trying to show that, that like line of uh, analysis that we keep with the work. So yeah, boom. So those are, that's the political lens for drinking more then. But yeah, and then, um, so yeah, so, and so all of that that we just touched on, that was us kind of seeing like, what is the, like, what is the playing field, right? What are we dealing with? And then we, we wanted to really, uh, consolidate that into like, uh, four pillars for liberation. Excuse me. Mm. Uh, so these are our, our four pillars and we, we always look back to these to guide uh, what's currently work, what happening with the work and like where we can go. Um, so the first pillar, uh, healthy, culturally appropriate food is a human right. We must address the entities that deny this right to black people. 
Um, that and, and that one's really just talking about the food system as a whole. Like we were just talking about that. Uh, this this human right is being denied to Black people, and it's a systemic thing that's happening. And we uh, we have to address these entities to start to create uh, sovereign food sources. The second one is we must build Black power in order to create the space for sovereign food sources, reduce current harms, and dismantle the existing food system. Um, and that one I think is really important because. Uh, it, it gives us an opportunity to reframe how we look at this idea of black power and what that means and uh, kind of take it away from like an image and ground it in uh, material situations for people. And when we're talking about power, we're just talking about uh, us as black people having the ability to really um, affect those decisions that affect our lives, right? And we have to, uh, we have to put ourselves in the positions to make those decisions. And, and then that's how we can get to creating the sovereign food sources and reducing the harms that we're experiencing from the food system. Um, the third one, black people must ensure our own food sources that are independent of the industrialized food system that is killing and oppressing us. This is just talking about the self-determination, right? Where um, this program is not about uh, trying to get a new Whole Foods in our neighborhood. It's about just making it so we all have what would be in a Whole Foods in our backyard or our neighbor does. And we can circulate that amongst ourselves and that becomes a whole different system that's uh, not tied to the industrialized food system that kills us, right? And then this, this fourth one is uh, really about the, the uh, long-term goals. And, it's, uh, and but this is something that we're practicing and, and really uh, learning from just like the community that we're in as we go. And the fourth one is a uh, collective black land stewardship as a politically radical practice is critical to securing black liberation and building an equitable, sustainable food system. And uh, the key piece in there, it just to start off is really black, uh, black land stewardship, right? And we, uh, we specifically wanted to get at stewardship and not ownership because we're looking towards um, the indigenous practices of people on this land, whether it's like the, uh, Akuma Odom, or we're talking about indigenous African practices. Where people didn't own land. There was just collective stewardship of the land. And uh, we all took care of the land, the land took care of us, right? And so uh, we see that as a really crucial lens to keep when we're talking about getting land to grow and uh, how we distribute the resources that come from that. So yeah, those are our four pillars for liberation. And that's, that, that's really how we ground like the path forward. Yeah. Um, cool. And then um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about kind of like where where folks can plug in. Um, uh, first of all, um, black folks, um, like become a grower. If you're not already growing, um, let's get you growing. Um, a, a big piece of what we uh, try to do is really provide the, uh, the resources um, and some of the support to help uh, new growers. Um, and so we all have to learn. Um, many, many of us um, are, are getting either reconnected with the land after a really long time or getting connected with the land for the first time. Um, and there's lots of reasons um, why that is, but what we can acknowledge is that we can get there together um, and so a lot of what we do is actually uh, helping people uh, just like open that door um, to, to make uh, growing a possibility. Um, we, we grow in, in basically in what, we, what we call uh, gardens, farms, and homesteads. So uh, gardens are family gardens, right? Like um, meant for family and some friends. Uh, we have farms uh, which are intentionally growing uh, as part of our food distribution program. And then we have homesteads, which are the, the larger acreages um, that are providing things like uh, chickens um, and, uh, and like uh, a larger scale of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, agriculture. Um, so the, uh, all of that we need help with, right? We need help building those sites, maintaining those sites, and that provides you an opportunity to learn, grow by getting your hands dirty. Um, 
We, as Coffee mentioned, we also have the acute response to COVID, which right now, um, you know, last week uh, we distributed uh, uh, fresh fruit, fruit and vegetables, uh, halal meat, eggs uh, to 140 black families, uh, primarily uh, refugee families. Um, that number is growing every week. Uh, COVID is not going away. Um, we're t we're, we've now we've done this for 24 weeks, um, and there's no end in sight. Um, so there's opportunities to help uh, you know distribute food in community. Um, so that's for Black folks. Um, for people of color and white accomplices, um, there's a role for you too. Uh, like you can help uh, you know prepare food for distribution. There's a lot of food. There's like uh, every week we have to go through this uh, this process, and uh, and so that's something that you can do with very little technical skill. Um, but if you have technical skills, uh, particularly around growing, come and be a support. Um, and uh, you know, folks are learning how to uh, how to grow at all different scale. Um, and so, what? Uh, some folks might need is just like uh, a, you know some technical support around their far their 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 family uh, uh, garden site, um, and other folks like we need support around larger uh, sites. You know, uh, a lot of our properties um, that we, uh, that we have access to um, sit on about a third acre lot, um, and we basically have uh, access to the entire yard. Um, so it's about a sixth of an acre. Um, and then when, with our homesteads, um, we're, we're at uh, half an acre and, and up. Um, and so we have, uh, we have some sites that are up to like three acres um, that, we're, that we're in development of right now. Um, the, you know, Khalil mentioned the, 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 uh, the importance of, of acknowledging stolen land. Um, and uh, if, if you are POC um, or a white accomplice, um, we need to have a conversation about reparations. Um, and land is a, it can be a form of reparations. Um, and uh, there's a deeper conversation, but to, to just kind of, to, to get there um, and like really quickly, um, like we do need to think about how to undo the harms that have been done um, and that that continue to be perpetuated um, by holding on to uh, institutional wealth um, and generational wealth that was built on stolen land and stolen bodies. Um, and there's no way to have that conversation with, except head on. Um, and so if you want to get into that, we totally can. Um, the last thing is, uh, we need cash. Um, so uh, we have uh, we have a really large uh, program um, that's doing uh, some some amazing things. Uh, we're less than a year old. Um, we started in October of 2019, um, and our bold goal for uh, for 2020 was to end this year with. A total of 20 families in our in our program. Um, by the time we hit, uh, hit March, uh, we already had 11 uh, families in the program, uh, and so we knew we were going to blow away the goal. Um, but it was also it was exciting, um, but it was also like a little terrifying because we, we didn't actually have the infrastructure. Um, then COVID hit, and. You know, the, the, the first weekend of uh, our acute response of uh, food distribution uh, was, was 12 families. Uh, in three weeks, we were over 100, um, and now we're here at 24 weeks, um, and we're consistently uh, at 100, 100, uh, I'm sorry, 140, 150, um, and it looks like this weekend we're going to probably be like 155. Um, we, uh, like, the way that we've been able to, to do that is by building relationships with black farmers um, and uh, through a, our political lens and also the, the, the very clear necessity of making sure that black 
families have access to healthy, culturally appropriate food, particularly in this moment when folks on the lowest rungs of the food security ladder have been pushed off and often pushed into food banks um, that are not providing that the, the same level of food um, or the same quality of food um, and definitely not from black food sources. Um, and so it's been critical for us to maintain that, that we walk in our values um, by supporting the black farmers who have been around for years um, and, uh, and really investing our dollars in them um, so they can turn around and invest in our community. Um, and we, you know, and we are very clear with all of our, uh, all of our families, all of our, our growers, um, that the food distribution uh, program is not charity. It's community. This is what community actually should look like and be in practice. Um, and that means we build together, that we respond, um, and most importantly, that we, we know that we, can, uh, that we can build towards a new vision collectively. Um, and so everyone plays their part um, in that. And so we end up doing, um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of reimagining, um, like, what it means to have uh, decision-making power over our food um, in very tangible ways. So uh, that's kind of like the formal get to know us. Um, if you wanna check us out on the, on the gram, uh, get at us. Uh, we're also on, on, on Facebook and all the other things. Um, and uh, uh, that's our website. So uh, it's drinkinggourdfarms.com. And you can learn more about what we're doing. Um, lots of lots of pictures uh, on Instagram. So if you're if you're into that, cool. Yeah. Hey Ken, this is Lauren, your moderator. We're getting a lot of questions in from the audience. Yep. I'm sorry if this is echo. Yep. So. Uh, yeah, we can. So can you hear that? Yeah, we. Um, so I. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to move. I'm going to go off this screen and I'm going to just speak. Let's see. Well, can you hear me now? <laughs> the question I have is for black folks who have little growing experience and live in apartments, does it cost anything to start growing? What's the process for receiving healthy food from the farm? Yeah, so, um, so it doesn't cost anything to start growing. We actually supply the, the, the base level of, of of resources and materials, um, as well as the the, the labor uh, to help get that going. The thing that we ask people to do before we build a garden for them is to actually come out and help build a garden for someone else. Think about it in terms of like you pay it forward, but also more importantly, you actually get some experience um, and understanding around uh, what is um, uh, what's possible in in your space. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Great. And then I have a question from Selesh Rowe, who is um, from Climate Healers. And he says, meat production is associated with colonialism, racism, ableism, and patriarchy, not to mention speciesism. Have this, has there been discussion around a vegan basis for your important work? Um, yeah, uh, so there's definitely been a uh, discussion around it just because of like the the role that veganism plays in um, like the current health landscape. But I, I, uh, a large part of the work that we're doing is uh, the uh, cultural bridging between ourselves as um, African people that have been in America for generations and then um, our, our African uh, siblings that have that spent most of their life on the continent and that their their cultural and or uh religious traditions uh don't really there there's not really a space for veganism because and i think it's it, it has a lot to do with what you're pointing out about about colonialism and the different uh contours of it where 
these people were able to be growing their own food and have local economies that weren't part of the global food system. So it, it, uh, I think it changes their relation to uh, meat production a little bit. And that's, that's kind of how we've been navigating it. So I think we, we definitely have folks like who are on our team who are plant-based and they uh, work on plant-based recipes for the community and things. But we also, we, uh, we definitely find it, it's important to us to be aware that uh, veganism as like a, a modern practice doesn't necessarily fit with the uh, lived experience and like cultural practice of the people that we're serving. So we like, we walk that line on it. Um, and then, <coughs> I'm oh, sorry. On the, on the, I mean, and the vegan side. Um, like, um, I am from East Africa, a um, country called Somalia. And I'm basically, uh, uh, we're not really uh, vegan, vegan, like, not yet anything that coming for animal. But um, the most people, they don't eat a lot of meat because they, there's no uh, uh, meat that available all the time to eat. So what we eat is different kind of, of food. Um, doesn't have uh, meat, but might have milk, might have uh, um, butter or you know, something related to a meat, but we don't we don't eat every day. Basically, every day a meat, unless you're living in a in a, in a in a city, and the people live in the city, they can buy a meat every day because they sell mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also we have on um, we have a large on um, an Indian um, live in our country. Uh, that doesn't eat doesn't eat meat at all. So it's, it's when you have when you have farmers when you have food that available for you, you can eat however you want to live because you have the source. You 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 grow in the coconut, you grow in the fruits, you grow in the vegetable, you grow in everything, and everything is is available for you to eat. But when you don't have that sort. You, you just gonna eat what you have to eat because you have to live to eat, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and here's another question. Are white folks also welcome to help maintain the farm site? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, that's um that's part of the work that yes, we do open up to white accomplices. So um Yes, um, we actually have a uh, we actually have a, a facilitator that we've been working with um, named Raji Ganesha. Do you want to you want to come step on and talk about it? Come on, I, come on. Okay, yeah, come on. So Raji, <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Raji, 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 Raji need to get here. Raji, <laughs> Raji and Copper are gonna get introduced. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. come on. <laughs> Beautiful. So we recognize that there was a huge need and a huge outreach. Um, many individuals reaching out that wanted to play their part in this movement of black liberation and food sovereignty. And so we took the time to get really clear on what that would look like and the facilitation of it. And so we have a really great educator here in the Valley who's been working. I mean, I know her personal as well, but she does a lot of work here in the community. And so when we really got clear about what that intention would look like and how we could welcome them into our space, uh, just as much as we welcome anybody into our space, there's a process, there is a level of education, clarity, and we wanna keep folks clean, clear, and curious about exactly what we're doing. So this here is Raji. Yes. So, um, you know, as a non-black person, but also like a, you know, a woman of color, I guess, use that language. Um, and also someone who comes from a non-Western community, it feels like a really special space to be able to engage with, you know, a lot of white accomplices and just non-black folks have reached out to Drinking Gore to find out how they can be uh, effective accomplices. And I think it's just so important to know that this organization is centered in the work of radical black liberation, right, which is different from certain other organizations that might be interested in collective liberation more broadly. So that means that there needs to be a shared understanding of value 
um, and place to speak to some of the things that Ken and Khalil were both talking about, right? In terms of the values of understanding why black folks um, and indigenous folks deserve reparations and return of land, for example. Those are different and more nuanced questions than just kind of solidarity. It goes deeper than that. Um, so there, we're starting um, an onboarding call for non-black folks who have been interested in figuring out how they can be of best uh, service to this work. The first one is gonna be this Thursday at 6 p.m. Um, so it'll just be a chance for um, folks to kind of share a little bit of what has brought them here, get really clear um, on the authentic intentions and sort of the self-reflective practice practices that people have, um, because it's just really important, right? That if folks are not in a place where they understand the depth of, of all of the factors that are at play to create work like Drinking Board, then it just might not be the right time uh, for you to get involved. And there's maybe just other edu education that needs to happen or other ways that you can redistribute your time and resources. Um, so that's kind of what is now being folded into the ways that they're working. And that's something that I'll uh, be facilitating and supporting. So non-black folks interested in supporting, you'll see me and I'm sure you can get my contact or whatever so I can support you to come to this correctly. <laughs> Is there anything else? No, you need to okay. Okay. okay, beautiful. So Thursday, 6 p.m. Yes. Step one. <laughs> ah, very good. So it's a couple questions on this note, but what's involved in helping with preparing the food for distribution? Do I come in and pick it up, prepare it at home or somewhere else, and then deliver it? And how do you address COVID-19 spread with masks, social distancing, et cetera? Beautiful. So we actually just upgraded our space given the fact that we started at about 17, I believe, 11 or 17 families on our first weekend. And now that we are on week 24, this weekend we will have 155. So um, last weekend was our first weekend at a new location that allots more space for us to properly hold each other accountable and safe given COVID. And we just don't know what we don't know. So of course, masks, gloves, you know, taking all the precautions that are necessary in order, in order to ensure that we are taking care of ourselves and each other. And so our distribution process really looks like folks, you know, getting clear on a need or want basis. And given that this is an acute response and we cannot food box our way to liberation, um, this is really a, an emergency like a, very much an acute response to being there for our community and also bridging the communicative gap that happens when it's like, this is not charity. We are more so family. And we really want to extend that outward to our communities in more, way than, in more ways than just growing food and um, growing a garden or just dropping a food box off, right? So um, our folks, they sign up with us. We get their addresses. We actually facilitate our volunteers to come. We have a packing time where we pack the food. And um, after that, we have about 10 delivery drivers that come on. We load their vehicles up and they go and they drop off their designated area. And so that's how our distribution works. Great. Um, can you provide maybe on your website a, a list of regional black farmers that sell to the general public? Absolutely. So we don't necessarily have that directly on our website. Uh, However, that could be something to be very well considered, absolutely. Um, I personally worked um, on farms and with farmers uh, working at the local Phoenix public uh, market and a few others around the valley. And so I've had the gracious and like amazing opportunity to be able to share space with the Golos. The Golos have uh, been here in Arizona and facilitating amazing produce and a lot of joy and just love to the community for, I wanna say, They've been there since the beginning. Yeah, it's been like 20 years. They're there every single Saturday. So this is our um, primary, this is our primary um, folks that we purchase our produce from. And they are always at the market every single Saturday. Other than that, you know, whatever we can source on our own, we're sourcing on our own. We don't have anybody else currently. So we, we've got, um, we've got two new, um, uh, oh, yeah. farmers uh, from so the Golos are from Liberia and then we have two new farmers who are from Sudan um, and we're just continuing to grow that network there by the way uh, we've heard rumors that there is a uh, a black owned chicken like uh, egg ranch uh, and so, it, it, yeah, it, if that is true and someone who knows them, uh, we, we definitely want to talk. Um, 
because that would be a that would be a, a big win. Uh, being able to just like source more of our eggs uh, from black owned sources. So, um, what's your approach on addressing the stolen land injustice, and how does that compare contrast from your approach of focusing on support of black farmers? Um, I think so. As far as um, how it's how it's happened in practice so far, it's really been about uh, cultural exchange and uh, looking trying to just uh, be in community with indigenous folks. And these are, are relationships that we're still developing. And I think um, there's a lot of uh, trauma healing to do between the relationships between indigenous folks and black folks because of the way we've been uh, pitted against each other through capitalism. So um, it's been, it's been um, material things such as just looking towards um, the uh, planting, uh, traditions of people that have uh, lived on this land. So like planting the uh, three sisters, which is uh, the squash, beans, and corn. And because uh, they grow so well in this environment and they grow symbiotically with each other. And that's uh, that's like uh, knowledge that has sustained indigenous people on this land for a long time. And, and we think so, we, we think there's a, a lot of exchange to be done just in really finding uh, the connection within those cultural practices. And that's like how it's happened. Uh, in practice, and I think uh, on the long term, we really, really want to look at the current examples that, that exist um, between uh, Black folks and uh, Indigenous folks throughout the country. Like, there's uh, some examples uh, in uh, New York. Leah Penniman, she's she's a uh, Black woman that has a farm and a whole program in New York, and um, they've done extensive. Um, uh, what is the word like uh, conflict resolution work with the indigenous tribes that they uh, where they are occupying land right now and they've really worked to come up with creative uh, solutions for how can uh, land actually be used equitably and how do you get away from ownership models and how do you uh, not just compromise but actually center indigenous folks with um, being able to, to conceptualize what are we going to do with the land and 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 I think our our vision our kind of projection on that is that um, if we're if we're working with indigenous folks and we're able to identify that we have the same barriers that we'll be able to come to uh, like equitable solutions that include black folks being able to have sovereign food sources and indigenous folks having the food sources and the land use needs that they uh, require so that's like the vision of it I would say. Very good. So um, do you partner with other local nonprofits for grow space or sourcing food, such as Spaces of Opportunity or Tiger Mountain Foundation? And do you also work within, within any of the school systems? Uh, so we, have a, uh, we don't necessarily partner um, with, with folks in that way, um, in part because uh, the, what we're focused on is, is a, a very clear political lens um well um you know we we want everyone to be able to grow and everyone to have access to healthy culturally appropriate food um we are very intentional about building black power um and so part of our our partnerships um ha have to be rooted in that um and so when when we uh when we engage with black farmers uh, about buying produce from them for our food distribution program. It is done not through a lens of, hey, do you have produce? But actually, are you down for this? Um, and, and actually challenging them to like often rethink how they're approaching their role within this larger system of capitalism uh, that is uh, like part of the industrialized food system. And so like being able to being able to have some some political alignment is like first and foremost in our, in our mind. Um, that said, we are actually finding uh, a, a, a lot of alignment with some community based groups um, who have already been like pushing towards uh, understanding healthy food sources from a systemic uh, 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 approach as opposed to direct services. 
And so we've been able to start to build those relationships. Um, again, this is like, you know, we're, we're not even a year old um, and like uh, uh, we're, we're still kind of like very, very like uh, in the in the new stages of, uh, of these partnerships. But we're excited about them um, because they already have the political alignment. Thanks. So um, how is um, your organization funded? What roles are taken up by volunteers and food donations? And what are paid for through salary and purchasing food? Um, so we receive uh, the bulk of our funding from uh, national uh, grants um, that are uh, focused on black liberation. Um, we've received some funding uh, here locally uh, from people who are specifically trying to help with COVID response. Um, and uh, a lot of individual donors, uh, folks who go to the website and give 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Um, and uh, that's, that's our primary sources of, 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 uh, of funding. Um, when it comes to ex expenditures, um, the bulk is actually um, uh, around food and farm materials. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, based off of what we're able to source from our own sources, plus what we're able to, to buy, um, you know, a food box uh, for one family runs about $55 um, a piece. Um, and that's to make sure that they have enough fruits, vegetables, meat and everything for, for a week. Um, there's uh, also just a lot of, of uh, material costs um, for these farm sites. Um, you know, we, the thing that we ask people to do um, is uh, you know, come out, see what we're, what we're about, and you'll, you'll see that there's some inherent challenges to, uh, to, to the idea of backyard farming. Uh, particularly in a lot of the uh, uh, you know communities that that we're like most pro uh, like uh, we're most focused in along the I-17 corridor, South Phoenix, along the 202 corridor, um, and this is where like the majority of, of our population um, you know exists, um, and so uh, we we end up uh, you know. From a from a from a kind of a a cost uh, perspective, that's the lion's share. We do have um, a, some some full time and a, a couple of part time staffers that really hold down the work, um, particularly ar ar around coordinating all the volunteers and coordinating the 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 logistics uh, necessary to to grow food. Can I, can I yeah. add on to that? And then just to to add on to. Uh, the details King gave about how everything is funded. I think um, we've we've talked about a, a collective vision we have, like since we are founded in being a abolitionist org and trying to uh, just uh, be imaginative about what that means when it comes to how we're being funded too. And I think um, as we're as we really uh, like ramped up. Uh, farm site production throughout the year as a response to COVID, trying to grow more food. I think we've seen that we can really create our own uh, sustainable economy once um, once we get everything planned and then we have this network of people producing uh, this uh, varied these these different varied foods. Uh, we can really start shifting to where. Uh, the funding doesn't have to come from outside this network that we've built and we're able to be funded from the community that is producing the food and make it uh, that well, more full circle. That leads into a question someone asked about your long-term vision as an organization and do you tend to develop a revenue stream to take away from reliance on grants? Well, yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that I that I think is where the vision is going because we we just understand that yeah part of having any sovereignty is about whatever your economic model is going to be and I think uh, yeah we're being very intentional about setting up the structure of what this network is as far as it being decentralized they're not being uh, traditional decision making processes the goal is definitely 
to uh, create uh, a space for all of these individual growers if they want to have their own revenue stream, but then we're also able to create a collective revenue stream that can produce a uh, drinking gourd general store or something like that, right? Where it's, um, we have our own ecosystem and it still deals with the US dollar until it doesn't have to, basically. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, that's with the very far future, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, some, somebody's well, going to have a couple white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, and so, so we're on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, this relates a little bit to before about collaboration, but do you collaborate with any indigenous food sovereignty groups like um, Ajo CSA or Slow Food Turtle Island and maybe any native seed um, groups that collect native seeds and disperse? Them. Yeah, so that that's been an, uh, something that we've been like slowly building those relationships out and and trying to uh, to do so in a way that that seeks to to find some some political alignment and and, and mutual understanding. So it's something that we're also like very much interested in continuing to to build, um, and we we think that uh, you know that if we are going to have black liberation, we cannot, we cannot separate that um, from indigenous liberation. Um, and so we, we want to, uh, we want to continue to grow. And, and, and uh, I think, uh, I, I think you mentioned one of the specific ones, uh, working with Native Seed Search out of Tucson. Um, that's something uh, we got for our last season, we got a lot of the seeds that we were growing uh, from Native Seed Search, because we specifically wanted to uh, have that uh, connection with the land, right, and and kind of respect that lineage. But yeah, it's definitely something that's growing and excited for whatever connections can come from people on that, for sure. So one, one last question as we hit the witching hour, but do any of you have agricultural experience? If not, where are you getting your technical assistance? Um, so we have varied uh, experience. Um, some of us uh, have been like backyard uh, gardeners for years. Uh, so folks like Khadija has been growing uh, ever since she got here. Um, we have other folks who are brand new to it and have never grown anything. A lot of our, uh, our technical experience, actually our technical support uh, comes from black farmers. Um, and that's something we're continuing to build relationships with, uh, like, and being able to have, you know, like the, the, the honest answer here is that, that a lot of our black farmers are getting older, right? Um, where like, it's, you know, it's sad, but true, but it's like a lot of the folks who have been working the land for any period of time are now in, you know, in their sixties, uh, they're starting to slow down, right? And they're starting to... Uh, have hard time like actually passing all, on all of that knowledge. Sixty's not old. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, is, it is when you work fourteen hours a day uh, on a farm. So, <laughs> <laughs> well said. Um, well, we want to thank you uh, to the entire uh, Drinking Gourds fam family, Ken to Khalil to Ibado to Coffee. Thank you so much for your time. We learned so much today. And uh, remind us again of your website because I know a lot of us want to go and make donations to help yeah, it, with materials and stuff. It's uh, drinkinggourdfarms.com. I'll throw it up on the screen just so you, you can see it. Um, go back one slide. Well, if you have any parting words, we'd love to hear them before we sign off. Um, no, we just want to thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, we love talking about, uh, about Drinking Gourd. Um, and uh, thank you, Lauren, for, uh, for putting this together for us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Be well. Bye. Hey guys. Somebody called me from Council.